Um, I want to congratulate everybody on a great job. And it's like we're packed standing room only, which is really exciting. Woo! Um, Woo! So for those of you who know about Mitchell Challenge, we're all about youth voice, all about empowering students to speak up about issues they care about, to make changes in their communities. And that's what you all did today. You got up on your soapbox, you gave a speech that you researched and you wrote and you practiced and you told your peers about things that are important to you and that's empowering to you and we're all very proud of you. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Cree from MS, uh, so hard to say, MSD. <laughs> got it, um, thank you Amanda. Um, and hello everybody. Uh, so if you are someone who needs just a little refresher on Project Soapbox, um, Project Soapbox is a program that asks students to develop and um, deliver a speech that answers the question, what is the most pressing issue facing young people today, and what should be done about it? Yeah. So that is the guiding question for the speeches, and this year, hundreds of Madison students participated in Project Soapbox. Round of applause for that. <laughs> Today, uh, students got to elevate your voice um, as you spoke in front of uh, so many of your peers, um, and we heard some amazing and very powerful speeches in our plenary rounds. So, congratulations to each and every one of you. We do want to introduce um, our special guest speaker. Um, so, Deputy Superintendent Dr. McCray, um, with some words from our NMSD. When, when, when Creed said my name, somebody yelled, and I thought I was a rock star. So whoever said that, thank you. Um, first and foremost, uh, good day, young change makers. Um, I stand before you today with the belief in the power that each of you hold within you. Your voices are the most powerful weapons capable of shaping the world around you and influence our course of history. As future leaders of tomorrow, it is crucial that you continue to use your voices for issues that matter and for causes that resonate with your hearts and soul. Give yourself a round of applause for this morning. As I was beginning to jot down what to say, I was reminded of a quote that says, let us be enraged about injustice, but let us not be destroyed by it. These profound words are by one of my favorite political activists, Bayard Rustin. He reminds us that while we should be moved to action by the injustice we see around us, we must also find the strength to persevere in the face of adversity. Let the rage that you have about topics that you suggested today fuel your passion for change, but do not let it extinguish the flame that you have within you. I hope that today is one reminder for you that democracy, it is the cornerstone of our society. It is a stagnant concept. It is a living, breathing entity that thrives from active participation. Your voices are the heartbeat of our society, and we need them. In our pursuit of a more just and equitable society, we must remember to lift up those stories and voices of those that have been silenced for so many years. Voices of women, those queer community, and some of our most marginalized individuals because they have been denied a seat at the table and their struggles and their triumphs have been pushed to the shadows. It is our duty to ensure that our voices are not only heard, but amplified. That our stories are just not told, but they are celebrated. Today, you've talked about women rights, school shooting, bullying, LGBTQ rights, gender equality. I had a young man from Senate to tell me he talked about war hunger today. That is an issue that he know we can solve, but we are choosing not to. These might be abstract, abstract concepts to some, but they are battles that we are fighting every day in every corner of our world. So your engagement in these conversations is not just a choice. 
It is a moral imperative. It is a call to action that demands your unwavering commitment and passion. So here's my urge for you today. You are not just a student. You are a warrior of change. So continue to speak up, speak out, and stand tall for what you believe in. Your voices have power to spark a revolution, to ignite the fire that the light for generations to come. Remember, democracy, it is not a spectator sport. It requires active participation from all of us. So together, let us build a world where every voice is heard, every story is valued, and everyone is treated with dignity and respect. The future is in your hands. So speak up and let your voices ring out loud and clear for the world to hear. Thank you. Did you know that cumulatively women menstruate for 10 years of their life? In these 10 years, it's been estimated that people spend around 10,000 US dollars, enough to buy a used car. And that's without the pink tax for charged in Wisconsin. Therefore, today I'm here to talk about period poverty. The reason this is such a big issue is because of the lack of access to menstrual hygiene products and education provided. We know this is an issue because the US News and World Report says low-income women are forced to make their own menstrual products out of unsanitary household items like toilet paper and rags. That means nearly 30% to three in one people who bleed cannot afford monthly period products. This supports the idea that period poverty is a very big problem because this is increasing people's chances of contracting toxic shock syndrome, urinary tract, and yeast infections. This is a problem because a lack of financial means should not have to put people in medical danger. Now, imagine a world where period poverty is not an issue. Did you even know this was an issue? However, if we correct this problem, we will see people who menstruate getting a higher education and being higher up in society. For example, the US News and World Report points out that menstruating teens miss up to 145 days of school by the 12th grade. And for adults, missed work hours add up, resulting in lower paychecks and stumbling blocks to advancement. Along with that, World Bank blogs points out that by enhancing access to quality menstrual and hygiene services globally, we can make significant advances in combating poverty and gender inequality. All of this proves that if women and girls get free access to good menstrual products, we could be higher up in society because the lack of access to health products would not lead to absences in school. And by fixing period poverty, perhaps all people can live in equality. Tools we have to work on this issue are to educate all people on menstruation. If we use our voices, both verbally or non-verbally, we can begin to fix this problem. Based on Yopi.com, we know that 42% of women say they've been period shamed by men, and 60% say they feel embarrassed when they menstruate. This is suggesting we don't normalize menstruation enough, talk about it enough. We are told by society, by men, and by other women that we should be embarrassed. Something natural, something we can't stop, something that creates life is what we're told to be ashamed of. So why not help support thousands of teens with menstrual products so they can get a higher education, move higher up in society, and be able to help others that suffer from period poverty? Everyone, even you, has a part in solving period poverty. I need you to firstly bring attention to this. As menstruators and non-menstruators alike, we all must help each other. 49.75% of the world's population is female. 14.2, 500 million females suffer from period poverty. An important step to combating period poverty is to supply all people who menstruate, menstrual hygiene products, and most importantly, education. And from my personal experience, the most important step is to educate young people who will menstruate on what's going to happen to them before it happens to them, because I didn't. And if we inform our future females on this issue, they will be able to know more about their bodies and what they produce. Now, if you contribute to helping this cause, no person will ever have to worry if they have to choose food or menstrual hygiene. 10 years, 3,500 days. 450 periods, the blood of 69 grown men, is what a body bleeds during its lifetime. And yet these women are told to choose. ¿Alguna vez has tenido la mala suerte de presenciar un tiroteo? Según la base de datos de tiroteos en escuelas, en 2022 se produjeron 303 tiroteos en recintos escolares, que causaron 332 víctimas frente a 250 tiroteos en 2021, 114 en 2020 y 58 en 2017. 
Como podemos observar, la cantidad va incrementando cada año y esto se debe a varios factores que son, por ejemplo, al acceso fácil de armas en algunos estados de Estados Unidos, a la falta de seguridad en algunas escuelas, entre otros. Mi nombre es Victoria y el día de hoy estaré profundizando un poco un tema tabú para algunas personas, que son los tiroteos escolares. Unas semanas atrás ocurrió otra tragedia evitable y sin sentido, en un lugar donde todos los estudiantes deberían estar seguros, las aulas y las escuelas primarias. En la escuela primaria Robe, en Uvalde, Texas, dos maestros y 19 niños fueron asesinados por un joven llamado Armado, con un chaleco antibalas una pistola y un rifle AR. Esos horribles actos de violencia se han vuelto demasiado comunes en las escuelas de Estados Unidos. Vemos las noticias con incredulidad cada vez que hay un tiroteo, pero la realidad es que estos actos de violencia sin sentido siguen ocurriendo. En lo que fue 2022 hubo 27 tiroteos en escuelas. Según datos de NPR y Edwick, en 2021 ese número será 34. Hubo 10 y 24 casos en 2020 y 2019, respectivamente con una disminución en 2020 debido al cierre de las escuelas durante la epidemia. Desafortunadamente, los tiroteos escolares en Estados Unidos son una anomalía. Como muestra de este mapa mundial, ningún otro país del mundo tiene tantos tiroteos escolares como Estados Unidos. No he terminado, ya va. <risa> Las investigaciones muestran que la mayoría de los estadounidenses comparten preocupaciones similares sobre la posesión no regulada de armas en nuestra sociedad. Según el Pew Research Center, existe un acuerdo bipartista, sustancial sobre algunas propuestas de políticas de armas, incluida la prohibición de que las personas con problemas de salud mental compren armas, que es que las personas con problemas mentales normalmente suelen hacer muy mal uso de estas armas. La mayoría de estos se han registrado que fueron los causantes de algunos tiroteos escolares, la mayoría. Según datos del New England Journal of Medicine, en la en inglés, en 2020 las armas fueron superando los accidentes de tráfico como principal causa de muerte entre niños de 1 a 19 años. Quiero mencionar que yo personalmente nunca he estado implicada en ninguno de estos, pero he tenido conocidos que sí, y la verdad es un, una situación súper horrible que no le desearía a nadie. En conclusión, los factores y causas de los tiroteos varían, y las armas no le hacen ningún daño a la humanidad. Sin embargo, ayudan a que ésta se lleve a cabo con facilidad. Algo que podemos hacer para ayudar sería tener mejor seguridad de los colegios, y hacer más difícil el acceso a armas en todos los estados. El problema no se erradicará completo, por completo, pero dejará de ser algo característico de los Estados Unidos o, por ejemplo, estados como Texas. Cuando piensas en Texas, la mayoría de la gente piensa como una burla el hecho de que Texas es un país, bueno, no un país, un estado con muchos tiroteos escolares. Muchas gracias. The biggest step a human can take is leaving, fleeing from home and leaving family behind when the war will ever return. I was five years old when I left Afghanistan with my family. I came to the United States because of the oppression and the poor living conditions. My dad made the biggest decision of his life, leaving his parents, his brothers, his sisters, his friends, and every single memory he made to come to the United States full of hope and full of excitement for himself and his kids. When we got here, we felt unprepared and lost. We knew nothing and we knew no one and nothing about the United States. Confused and scared of where to go next, we were drowning in regret and just wanted to go back home. It's not just Afghans that think this way. Most immigrants that come to the U.S. are always excited. But when they get here, they're alone with no support. My dad told me all the people he's been trying to help out don't know where to start and are filled with regret or this feeling of inability to move forward. The picture of the United States being so amazing slowly becomes unknown to them. My dad helps out immigrants like this voluntarily. About six months ago, a family moved to Baraboo. They were a, fa a big family and lived in the countryside. While other houses were mile apart, they felt alone, and they weren't aware of where to go next or what would be the next step. For about a month, he would buy them groceries and reassure them that they weren't alone. He tied them to people who could help them out more than he could and help them look for jobs and also got their kids into school. Currently, they are more stable They move somewhere where there's more people and they aren't all alone. They have built relationships with their neighbors and they are feeling better compared to the first couple days being here. I read about somebody else's experiences. Her name was Alyssa. She immigrated from Burma with her family at six years old. She explained that they had a hard time adapting and felt like outsiders because they were different from everyone else. 
She says she was fortunate that at least she had relatives, because otherwise their journey would have been way harder. Not knowing anyone who has experience living in the U.S. makes it more intimidating being here. She also says she didn't want to lose her own culture while trying to assimilate into American culture. Usually when you see someone different from you, it's hard to not look, whether you're being curious or just judging. Most immigrants get offended because it feels like they're being judged, which is another reason why it's hard for them to reach out because they get anxious. But now Alyssa is more stable, she learned to not care what people thought of her and use it as an opportunity to teach, about, teach people about her culture. If you think of people who do not have relatives who already live here and can't speak any English, some of them are excited to live, and now they're already here, how do we help them sustain life without getting anxious and regretful? Right now, the Office of Ref Refugee Resettlement in Washington, D.C. helps determine which refugees are sent to Madison. Madison receives refugees primarily from Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Research shows that throughout U.S. history, refugees themselves have been the best source of help for other refugees. Therefore, it is an informal policy that certain nationalities are initially placed in specific geographic areas. Programs like Open Doors for Refugees offer help to immigrants in the Madison area, but finding them and spreading the word to them is hard. Many immigrants at school learn English pretty fast, so we could start a program at any school and give, and give information to them so they can tell their parents or guardians. But if a family does not have kids, most of the time, as stated earlier, refugees can help out other refugees. So currently, any immigrants that are stable could reach out to any who are completely new. If any additional funding is ever needed, the government can provide for it. Also, JSS is a program that, program that always, help, always has official numbers of the new arrivals, but getting a response may be difficult. So I think the best way to overcome this is to start a program at school and spread the word to students. It would have been amazing if my family had a support and reminded us that we weren't alone, and just because we were different did not mean we didn't belong. Imagine you're a middle schooler, you're in homeroom, then you go to passing period, it goes completely silent for a moment, then you hear a bang, 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 getting closer and closer. You hear locks, lights, out of sight over the loudspeakers. You run to an empty class and slam the door. This has been the reality for thousands of students over the past 10 years. My topic is school shootings and the impact they have on kids and teens learning. The problem is school shootings, and the reason it's a problem is because we need stronger gun laws so that kids aren't scared at school and distracted because they think someone with a gun would come into their school trying to hurt them. Right now, according to Pew Research Center, a third of U.S. adults own handguns, and 61% of Americans say it is too easy to legally obtain a gun in this country. Everyone should know that no child should have to practice hiding in the corner of a classroom. As a middle schooler, I've had to do this ever since I was in kindergarten. I've been in one lockdown in a summer school and many holds this year. It's scary because we have no idea if it's a direct threat or not. And if I, especially because of my height, it's not very easy to hide well. Imagine a world where your kid didn't have to practice lockdown drills and where the school secretary didn't have to say locks lights out of sight. Imagine a world where 25% of kids didn't have a severe fear of school shootings. Imagine a world where 32% of kids didn't have a hard time working because they were scared of someone coming to their school trying to shoot them. My vision is not having to worry about getting shot in a place where I have to go every day. I want a world that doesn't have bulletproof backpacks. I want a world where 106,964,833 parents, including my own, don't have to worry about sending me off to school to learn. So can you please post on social media, donate to harder gun law websites, and have those tough conversations with people so they can get better educated on this topic. My name is Gwen, and if you are in school, a parent, teacher, or other staff at a school, please speak up because your voice matters the most. I wish I could go to school every day and say I don't worry every single time my school secretary goes over the loudspeakers. I wish I could say that I'd hear people talk about this more, but I can't. To better understand the challenges we are facing, visit nces.ed.gov. Again, nces.ed.gov and form your own opinion and make the change I need. I need DC to address this topic immediately so I can know I can go to school every day and not worry about getting shot. I will end with a quote by Malala Yousaf. 
When the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. I'm trying to make my voice power powerful. What about you? Ryan Lewis, American record producer and DJ, once said, the world is an unfair place because of bullying. And unfortunately, he's right. Bullying, defined as intentional harm that instills fear, is a serious issue that impacts countless individuals. Now, what does a bully mean? A bully is someone who goes out of their way to hurt or harm others, leaving them feeling scared, unwelcome, and sad. The earliest records of bullying started in the 1800s, but began to increase dramatically in the 1970s and still persists today. Bullying can occur at any stage of life, from early childhood to adulthood. According to Together Against Bullying, 10% of dropouts in schools and over 100,000 college dropouts are because of bullying. This leads to severe mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Furthermore, workplace bullying is an important problem that we need to address. Speaking out against bullying can foster a more inclusive and harassment-free environment for the next generation. Now, some people might be thinking, what causes a person to bully? Bullies often have a history of being bullied or growing up in environments where violence or neglect happens, as suggested by research from SIU News. Octavia Butler once said, not everyone has been a bully or the victim of bullies, but everyone has seen bullying, and by seeing it, has responded to it by joining in or objecting, by laughing or keeping silent, by feeling disgusted or feeling interested. Bullying is changing how people think, too. According to the National Institute of Health, the risk of depression in children and adolescents who were bullied was 2.77 times higher than that of those who were not bullied. And bully victims are two to nine times more likely to commit suicide than non-bullied students. However, efforts to combat bullying are underway through initiatives like the OAS Bullying Prevention Program, Stomp Out Bullying, and the National Association of People Against Bullying. These organizations educate students, parents, and teachers on prevention and intervention strategies for bullying. However, Despite their admirable efforts, bullying is still an event that happens daily, highlighting the importance of their initiatives. We also can help with this movement. We should encourage each other to do what we want and always respect each other. If we see someone getting bullied, speak up. Stand up for them and be an ally instead of being a bystander. I have been bullied before. I was so scared to come to school and avoid the person every time I went to school. I was called names, criticized because I was short, getting pushed to the ground, and was even told to fight someone. I know how people who have been bullied feel, and it's not a good feeling. My name is Sanjay Ramesh, and I believe that the world should not be a place for hatred and disrespect, and we should never let it be that way. We need to respect everyone for who they want to be instead of pointing out their faults so we can all live peacefully, respectfully, and in unity, so that we can be who we are. Thank you. Today, I will be coming to you with a topic that is not talked about as much as it should be, but is so relevant in our world today. Today, I will be talking to you about how technology is affecting our education. Do you think education is important? Because I do. Without education or knowledge, our world would be stuck in the past. Our society would be much less functional, and humanity would be in a worse place as a whole. However, ironically, one of the things that we as a society take for granted is education. Recently, there has been a concerning amount of educators, principals, and teachers all stepping forward saying the same thing. The, edu the education of our newest generation is getting worse, and they are sick of it and I think screens might be to blame. Before I get any further into this speech, I want to clarify that I am not trying to demonize screens and the internet. In some ways, the increase in technology has been extremely beneficial in terms of accessibility and unlimited access to endless information. However, the positive aspects of modern technology have in a way become its downfall. Why, you ask? Well, 
Imagine if you were a fourth grade student in a classroom that used computers or iPads as the main learning resource. Now imagine that your teacher handed you a computer and said, hey, we're doing a very important project this year and you need to do some research on a topic of your choice. What would you, a fourth grader, do in this situation? Would you do the research or would you Google the first game website that came to your mind? Do you see where I'm going with this? I know, and I am sure many of you know, how hard it is to stop playing on a screen when you start. The difference with me, though, is that I am in eighth grade. I am 13 years old, and if it's hard to me, hard for me to control myself around screens, just imagine how hard it is for a nine-year-old to control themselves. It isn't fair to blame children for failing if they are set up to fail. I have even talked to my own sister in fourth grade. She says that over half of her classmates cannot read. Why should my sister have to grow up in a world where the education system is failing her? As if, as if to prove this, about 63% of Gen Alpha fourth graders today cannot read and are not proficient in reading. This, 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 this statistic is alarmingly higher than in previous generations when almost two-thirds of the fourth grade population could read proficient, proficiently. Additionally, multiple studies have shown that excessive screen time and multitasking can be associated with lower cognitive and logic skills. And sadly, according to AACP.org, AACP four to six hours was the average screen time for kids under the age of 12. Think about that, 12 years old, not even a teenager, which is about 18.75 to 25% of their day using screens. This means that instead of opting this means that instead of using that up to quarter of their day for imagination and interaction, kids under the age of 12 are opting for screens instead of the real world. My call to action is simple. For one, if you are a teacher or parent of a child who uses electronic devices frequently, don't be harsh on your child or students. You are their role model. Instead, make a plan with your child or student, with them. Do your best to make sure that they can develop good habits around screen time and not get distracted or abuse it. As Malcolm X puts it, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare, it, for, prepare for it today. Instead of spending your whole life glued to a device that you will easily forget the experience of, try to see the amazing things around you, use your imagination, and be observant in the world offline. This will not only help you stay more organized, it will help you be more in tune with yourself and the ones you love. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and advocates for justice, I stand here before you today to address a topic of profound significance, abortion rights. In a world that is constantly evolving, our understanding of autonomy must also progress. The right to choose is crucial, allowing each person the ability and respect to control their reproductive health. When people are denied the right to make decisions about their own bodies, the consequences can be dire, leading to unsafe and potentially life-threatening situations. Take, for example, Amanda Zorowski. In December of 2021, she found out she was going to have a child. It was a miracle, and she and her husband were overjoyed. However, just four months into her pregnancy, her water broke. The amniotic that our child depended on was leaking, and she found that she was going to lose her daughter. To make matters worse, she was now at risk of a deadly infection, which could lead to sepsis, a severe life-threatening medical emergency. Under Texas law, her doctors were not able to terminate the pregnancy until she was considered sick enough that her life was at risk. Three days later, she went into septic shock. Her husband rushed her to the hospital, and she barely made it out alive. To quote a CNN Health article, the Zorowskis say the politicians voted for the anti-abortion law call themselves pro-life. They don't see it that way. Amanda had to suffer all of this because of the way abortion laws were written in her state, and she is not the only one. There are about 160 incidents of maternal mortality out of every 100,000 live births, and with abortion banned, that number rises to a whopping 300. Not only that, but with abortion illegal, women around the world have been resorting to unsafe abortion. An unsafe abortion, according to the National Library of Medicine, is a procedure for terminating an unwanted pregnancy carried out either by persons lacking the necessary skills or in an environment that does not conform to minimal medical standards, or both. 
Unskilled providers can also make things worse by causing infections and uterine perforations. An American Progress article states, pregnancy carries risks, including death. Without abortion access, more women will die. So I need you to help us on our journey to ensure safe abortion rights for all. Protest. Donate to people in need of abortion or individual clinics that keep our clinics. Speak up to your family members, friends, classmates, and anyone else you can think of. Urge Congress and the Biden administration to take immediate action. Some people say that abortion is murder. That by aborting a fetus, you're extinguishing life. However, banned abortions lead to thousands of women dying around the world annually. So, overall, they're wrong. Abortion saves lives. Thank you. UW-Hillel holds 4,000 Jewish UW Madden students and is referred to as the largest and most inclusive campus, but was attacked on December 8, 2023, when two men barged in during a Hanukkah gathering and started shouting horrible things at the students. They disturbed a peaceful and private gathering for a special holiday. If this is the most inclusive campus, I can't even begin to imagine what's happening at the other campuses. I'm Michaela Kleiman, and I'm here to acknowledge an issue in our world, anti-Semitism, the prejudice and hatred against Jewish people. Adolf Hitler was one of the main publicizers of this cruel ideology, and in 1925, he wrote My Struggle, which called for the execution of all Jews. This spread like wildfire throughout Germany, and soon enough that in the polls, the Nazi party's votes went from only 2.63% in 1928 to 99.1% in 1938. That gave Hitler the power to initiate the final solution, which ended up putting Jewish people in horrible living conditions and the death of more than 6 million Jewish people who were deemed too old, too young, or disabled for the other horrible things that they were put through. November 18, 2023, a neo-Nazi group carried swastika flags and shouted anti-Semitic chants from the UW-Madison campus to the Heaven Synagogue, one of the oldest standing synagogues in the U.S. And nobody even tried to stop them. Imagine coming to the U.S. at six years old, $100 in a suitcase with five pairs of clothes, in hopes of living the American dream, but instead being bullied picked on and beaten, just for the simple fact that you were a Jewish immigrant. How would you feel? Well, this was reality for my dad. 49 years of his life he's been here and is still discriminated against now. If there was a world without anti-Semitism, Jewish people could live a life of freedom. It would lift a heavy weight off their backs for the simple guilt of being Jewish. And we wouldn't have to go outside afraid of what would happen to us. How would you feel afraid to step outside because people hated you for how you were or how you believed? So many questions, but the answer lies within yourself. You can speak up when you see something anti-Semitic happening. You can mark the beginning of the end to this life-threatening, no, life-destroying issue. Help our Jewish communities and let them know that you care. Thank you. Fifty-one thousand. That is the number of public school teachers that quit teaching in 2023 alone. Fifty-one thousand. Does this number surprise you? Well, if you're not in school, it might. But kids and teachers understand the struggle of being in school for seven plus hours each day. Fifty percent of all middle school kids constantly feel burnt out. I myself am part of this percent. But who can blame me? With the amount of work we have, the schedule, mixed in with the pressures of being a teen, it's hard not to be. But students aren't the only ones who are stressed. Teachers are stressed, and we are feeling the impact. Think about a perfect world where teachers actually get paid what they deserve, kids aren't depressed, teachers want to go to school, proper heating and cooling systems, edible food, clean hallways, things that actually work. The list goes on forever. These seem like basic necessities, right? So why aren't they being treated like ones? 50 million kids go to school in the US alone, and I am sure all 50 million, 
50 million of them see things that should change. I myself have firsthand seen the lack of respect towards the few teachers we have. Both my parents are teachers and I see what they go through. Mean kids, not enough time, going to school and having their classrooms either 10 degrees or 100. This is the reality of many teachers and we're still wondering why 50% of them have thought about leaving. Let's face it, if we do nothing, nothing's gonna get better. Nothing's gonna change. We need our teachers. We need our future generations to have what we don't, a better school environment. We need people like you, talk to MMSD, hear what they have to say, find the answers they were too scared to put on their website, find the truth. We need your voices, not only to complain, but to spread a little bit of kindness. You'd be surprised on how far it goes, especially for awkward, insecure middle schoolers. It really helps. School is never perfect, and to be honest, it will probably never be perfect, but it can be better. It is more than possible to have clean hallways, to have better food, to pay teachers more than a 0% raise. It is all possible, but we will never get there if we just keep sitting here and hoping. Sometimes you can't just hope. Sometimes wishing isn't good enough. Sometimes you need to stand up for what is right, and now is that time. We need everyone we can get to rally together. For me, for you, for our teachers, and for our children. Your voice matters just as much as anyone else's. You can make the change. Thank you. The hurt that beauty standards cause doesn't just affect how we look, it affects us as a human. According to Ocean State Stories, by the age of 13, 53% of females say they are unhappy with their body. By 17, 78% of females start to feel the same. Us teenage females already deal with so much in our everyday life. We are held to such a high standard, told how to look, how to act, what we should and shouldn't eat, what clothes we can wear. The world puts us in a box and tells us who we should be as people. Females in my life feel they can't even leave the house without looking the best they can. Some girls at my job express they don't even feel good about themselves without makeup, lashes, nails, etc. I can't go anywhere if my clothes are too tight or my makeup isn't perfect. Why? Because we are all scared of what people might say. It's a mutual feeling all around. Girls that don't feel good enough about themselves without changing something. And why should you care? Because these aren't just random teenagers. This could be your sister, your friend, your family. We are all feeling this feeling, and the feeling of not being what everyone is and wants to be can affect how you view yourself more than you think. According to Michigan Medicine, one in five parents say their teens avoid things like being in pictures because of how they think they look. It's time to start supporting our girls that struggle with their self-confidence. We all need to stop expect we all need to stop expecting so much from these growing girls. You all need to stop trying to control how we express ourselves. We need to stop holding such high standards and let these girls figure out who they are so they can love the true versions of them. Stop showing us who we should be when you can show us who we can be. We need to teach the males and even the females in our life that they have no say what's wrong with others when they are just as imperfect. I want more support in schools, social media, the outside world, life in general. We all need to start treating all females as human. Teach the males in our lives the right way to speak to us, what they have a say in, and what they do and don't get an opinion on. Start showing girls that they have the freedom to figure out who they want to be in the future. If we don't, when it comes to the real world of making the decision for themselves and fit, finding out who they want to be, they will be lost. They will grow up or live the rest of their life thinking they have to be what everyone else wants them to be. Perfect. And if not, then nothing. We need to teach these same females the difference between social media beauty and natural beauty that we all need to step up and support each other. Stop making life a war and trying to compete with everyone around us. I want more girls to stand up and fight the battle we have been fighting for so long. Open your eyes, step up. Not one person here fits the standard, so why shame us and yourself? Woo!